Opportunities on the money. You're invited to be part of today's show. Call 356-9397. Opinions and views expressed represent those of the guests and do not necessarily represent those of the station. And now, Paul Rudy's On the Money. Hopefully we're uh, I think we're good now. Hi, I'm Paul Rudy. Welcome to Paul Rudy's On the Money Radio Show. Thanks for joining us today. I'm joined by certified financial planner professional David Rudy and financial advisor Ryan Repko from Rudy Wealth Management. Both of those guys, and of course the great one, Dr. Fred Gertz. Welcome, Dr. Fred. <laughs> I like Thanks. that nickname, the great yeah. one. <laughs> well, the great one. It's kind of a Sean Hannity ripoff, I guess. He talks about somebody else. I forget. Uh, Mark Levin or something, the great one. And I always think of Fred as the great one. Uh, you're welcome to call in today with your questions at 356-9397 or text us on the Castle Heating and Cooling text line 351-5317. You can also email your question to talk at wdws.com. We also want to welcome those tuning in on Facebook Live. We have Facebook Live on our wise owl video camera, guys. It's important to recognize that past performance is not an indication of future results. You should not make any investment decisions without first consulting your own financial advisor and conducting your own research and due diligence. That's probably good stuff to think about. Anyway, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this, but basically we do the show not so much to pontificate, guys, but to try to bring up issues and more importantly, as I say, bring up questions people can ask their current advisor or a potential advisor. And uh, if anything, if we can do that, if we can get people to the point where they ask, they're ask, they asking the right questions, then they can determine for themselves whether they get the right answers or not. So welcome all the guys. And uh, Dr. Fred, um, boy, I mean, is everything coming up roses? I, you know, right. Except for Turkey. Yeah, now, right. I guess we're going to have a Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah we can, I guess uh, the term is uh, Turkey is a new Greece. So. <laughs> it is, you know, and it just reminded me that really since 2009, the bad news bears, as I call them, or the pow, uh, pouting pundits of pessimism, maybe some might call them. Uh, what have we been hearing really since the market bottomed in March of 2009? You know, it's always something, you know, the next thing, next shoe's going to drop. And and they've been just dead wrong all along. This has been one of the greatest bull markets uh, we've ever experienced. And, uh, but they still doesn't slow them down, doesn't stop them. And now it's Turkey and tariffs and Probably, the, probably add a couple more things on there. And, yeah, the difference. Uh, they'll this probably year, be wrong again. Yeah, yeah, the difference this time is that in the past, uh, uh, most governments tried to support uh, the currencies that were under stress. <laughs> now, uh, the United States with uh, President Trump is actually putting more pressure on them through the uh, tariffs and so on that uh, is kind of undermining their efforts to deal with their currency problems. So Turkey is a, a problematic situation. We have a a person there who's uh, probably a would-be dictator, and uh, the United States doesn't like that, but they also like the stability that Turkey provides in the region, so it's kind of a difficult choice. And we still hear a lot about tariffs, but it, it strikes me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me when you have a system that's a little bit gamed by other countries, in other words, when other countries have a much more favorable tariff uh, relationship with us, it does kind of prop up those economies, does it not, a little bit? Uh, only in the short run. It's, it's counterproductive. I mean, well, uh, they need it, right? But uh, it, it doesn't work for them in the long run either. And, and the problem with us, with the United States trying to do that, uh, we're a, obviously a big player and it's, just, it's just better off not to get into that kind of game. We may get some uh, so-called mistreatment in certain areas. Sure. But again, uh, the, the kind of problems that President uh, Trump is worried about are really not uh, true problems. We're never going to sell more to China than they buy from us. We don't, they simply don't do that. And there's no particular reason why trade between any two countries is, should be balanced. But and, it's fair to say that the U.S. Uh, is probably has a, a, a naturally stronger economy, you know, even relation with tariffs. And it seems like countries that aren't as free and as open and, you know, and don't protect people's property rights, it seems like they almost need intervention to keep their economies going where we can kind of just say, well, all right, tariffs may not be a good idea, but we're going to still be a right. really, really strong economy. But it doesn't work that way in the long run for um, those countries either. So Right. Uh, and so, I mean, maybe a lot of this trade stuff gets, some of those wrinkles get ironed out. Yeah. I well, suspect. it seems like the, uh, certainly the uh, markets are absorbing it fairly, fairly easily. I, again, as you said, though, uh, 
uh, there, there appears to be uh, very optimistic predictions about the rest of this year, but then people are always saying, well, we may hit 3% growth this year, but what about next year? Well, sure. there's always something to worry about. I remember uh, back when um, Illinois had the uh, uh, NCAA runner-up team and we were undefeated most of the season and so on, and people were calling out on the talk on the uh, sports show saying, well, what about next year? We're going to be as good. <laughs> and, and That's the way <laughs> Americans are, though, right? We, we like to fix stuff. We like to worry about what's coming next. It just uh, it just sure seems like the U.S. economy is is really truly rolling along pretty strong, uh, in a pretty strong fashion, and uh, it doesn't seem like, to me, when you look at a lot of the leading indicators, things that happened prior to a recession, it doesn't really seem like they're in place. It doesn't look it looks like we're okay for 2018, from what we can tell, and probably late 2019 until, you know, the classic signs. Uh, you look for housing to weaken. You look for an inverted yield curve. You look for employment to start to weaken all these things things that aren't happening housing is not it's losing a little bit of its steam but and even when those things happen it strikes me that the lag time when since you brought it up when you know we might be okay this year and they what's how's next year look and again we're not in the forecasting business we're just trying to make some observations uh you know just from historical data if that's even appropriate but it would even suggest at least that we're probably a ways off from any right. recession. Well, yeah. there's still going to be recessions, yeah. right, Fred? But the uh, the, uh, the obvious uh, caveat is that we're not particularly good at predicting recessions. So, uh, again, they, they come occasionally. There's no particular reason that uh, we could get a recession every 10 years or something of that sort. But, again, uh, even the, the worst recession uh, in memory, you know, 2007 to 2009, we didn't really know we were in a recession until a year after it started. So it began in – uh, 2007, and, and people were still in the summer of 2008 with, were hoping that we'd have what was called a soft landing rather than a downturn. So yeah, there's a lot of talk about a soft landing. So it's very difficult to, to predict, but again, there are no particular signs that we're on, that Sure. On the other hand, you know, you did have a, uh, what everybody's fretting about now, potential uh, inverted yield curve when short-term rates are higher than long-term treasury rates. Uh, you had a weakening of employment. You had certainly you had a weakening right. in the housing industry. Some of these classic signs. Right. That are, again, there's no precision here. It's like looking at a, a clock with no hands on it. It's kind of like, well, uh, it probably feels like you know some of the things are there uh, for a recession, but it's, yeah. it, they're not useful enough. I guess probably what you're really maybe saying is, yeah, that's true, Paul, but it's really not all that useful. It's certainly not a timing mechanism. Right. It and the other thing is that. Uh, uh, Recessions are not always like uh, 2007 to 2009. They're often uh, relatively short and have uh, really small consequences. So no particular reason, even if we had a recession, that we would go back into a financial crisis similar to uh, 10 years ago or so. Yeah, I remember, and this might have been 20 years ago, might have been 30 years ago. I don't remember. Uh, it was probably 25 years ago. I went, I, I went to a conference, and Art Laffer uh, spoke at the conference, and he talked about the four or five prosperity pillars high taxation, a trend towards higher regulation, um, a, a, a over tightening monetary policy, uh, trade issues, uh, just to name four of them. Uh, I think I might have meant taxation, uh, it, it, you know, maybe an overheating economy. Doesn't, I guess trade might be one of the problem, uh, right. you know, problem areas. Uh, I made some notes here. Excessive government spending. That was the one yeah. I was missing. But we, and, and uh, we certainly have that one. So two out of five, maybe, or... Yeah, if you go back uh, the last 10 years of expansion, uh, the, the saying is there's always something. <laughs> We've had uh, large deficits, but uh, uh, shutting down the government, sure. uh, uh, crisis in, in Greece, hurricane, hurricanes, and bad weather, and uh, uh, North Korea threats, all kinds of things. So there's always something, and you can always find something uh, looking back, but sure. again, in the future... Uh, no particular uh, problems that are, that are obvious on the horizon right and, now. And even though, and you've just described my 35 years in this business uh, and watching the Dow go from 1,000 to 25 or 26,000 now, it's in, that, it's in the middle of that zone. Uh, I think that's, you know, I was talking to Ed Bond before the yeah. show, and he says, well, you just keep saying, just hold on, you yeah. know, for the long term. And yeah. that almost sounds silly, but uh, it's kind of interesting you mentioned all the, just, just a few of the things, the backdrop of the last three to four decades, and yet the American business person uh, seems to tr be able to transcend those problems, innovate, figure things out. We occasionally get these really big technology boosts that really kind of take everybody by surprise. 
uh, I think surprised at the extent of what they can actually do, probably more than they do. I think like a lot of technological booms, uh, a lot of times people never make the money they thought, you know, the, the technology does more than everybody thought, but it's very difficult to cash in on them. Right. But it's been an interesting three and a half decades to me. And, and if there's anything that I've said on the show, there's always something to worry about, isn't there? Right. Uh, and again, uh, the last 10 years, uh, I, I uh, deal with actuaries and people who make uh, uh, forecasts. And it's always been, well, our rates of return are going to be lower. We can't continue six, seven, eight percent uh, returns on equity. And the fact is we, we have, now that doesn't mean we will in the future, but. Uh, I hear that Fred, uh, and I've heard that now for at least 10 years that the expected returns for stocks can't be as high in the future. And I can't make, uh, even we're gonna take a call here with Brian in just a moment, uh, but I can't make a theoretical case. Risk hasn't disappeared. Risk no. hasn't, in my view, risk hasn't declined. So why would we expect I want to get back to that, uh, but I want to go to Brian first. Uh, Brian, thanks for calling on the money. What can we do for you today? Yeah, permission to speak to the great one. Dr. Fred, <laughs> they're calling for you. <laughs> yes, sir, okay. Brian. I'd like to know if the deficit's going up, and if it's going up, is it higher or lower as a percent of the GDP? And uh, is the trade deficit going up? And do you see that as a problem for the uh, Trump administration, or do you see it getting better? Well, I think the uh, deficit clearly is high right now. It's not, not as high uh, as uh, a percentage of uh, GDP as it was during the recession, but it's going up largely because of, uh, of tax cuts and, and various expenditure programs. So uh, Trump is not a, a kind of typical conservative if there is such a thing because he's done two things. One, he's cut taxes and also allowed spending to increase. So I think there is some uh, uh, difficulty there, but it's probably not a difficulty for Trump. It's probably a difficulty for uh, some president, uh, you know, eight years or 10 years or 12 years from now because the deficit problem is something that's cumulative. The uh, overall debt to GDP ratio is rising and that, that's obviously a problem. So I think that's something to worry about, but I'm not sure it's anything to worry about in the short run. The other question about the trade deficit, uh, that really isn't very much of a problem. The trade deficit uh, is a result of, of the United States buying more in, in uh, current goods and services from other countries. And in return though, that's financed by people who want to invest in the United States. And the reason they want to invest in the United States is it's probably the best place in the world to park your money. So I'm not really very concerned about the, the trade deficit. And Fred, didn't we spend most of last century uh, in a trade deficit, and we we became the world's strongest economy. Uh, so in the same time, it's not even a measure. Um, again, if you're if you're um, buying more than you you're selling, and you have no way of making up for that in terms of uh, in terms of uh, inflow of uh, investment, that's a problem. But we don't have that. But right we're now. buying those goods that you know right. Americans buying more. But they're not doing that at gunpoint, right? No. They're doing that because that's what they want. They right. like these goods. Either. And foreigners are, are also investing in the United States, not at gunpoint. They want to park their their uh, assets here. And they get dollars, yeah. right. uh, and they got to do something with those dollars. Right. I mean, they can either sit on them and thanks, we got your stuff for free, or they're going to turn around yeah. and make investments in America. Well, the other thing is that. Uh, I don't think it's uh, talked about very much now, but the question, the question always uh, came up, well, the Chinese have all these uh, dollars. What if they walk in and say, give us our, our whatever uh, in a particular day? Well, they could do that, but that's going to weaken their assets. They, have, their no, currency. they have no uh, interest in, uh, in weakening the economy where they're parking a lot of their, their funds. And not only that, don't they need those dollars? I mean, nobody's going to accept just the Chinese currency yeah. without U.S. reserves behind them. Right. I, I mean, that's the way I've always felt. Right. Does that answer your question, Brian? So again, I, I, to summarize, I, oh. I think the deficit, the, the uh, fiscal deficit is a problem, but not an immediate one, something we have to worry about. We've been saying this for a long time and no one really worries very much about it, but it's gonna, there'll, there'll come a day when it'll be important. I think the trade deficit is uh, less important. And Fred, it, it, I, I forget, I was gonna, I forget where I was gonna go with that, but it, it just strikes me that, uh, that the too much, the excessive government spending, that's more of a crowding out of the private economy issue, really. Right. Is that just, does that not, I'm just asking, does that tend to be 
a drag on the economy? It does to more a certain than anything. extent. And again, it depends how the funds are used. If they're used productively, maybe not. But the, the bigger said problem, government spending. Yeah, Fred. The bigger problem is, uh, again, uh, things happen, and uh, when countries get a very large uh, debt to GDP ratio, there there's uh, potential problems. There, it's not a uh, automatic. It's not uh, something that's going to happen in the next uh, few years, but something we do have to be concerned about. Brian, does that you answer? That we, Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Do, you, do you think we uh, we can grow uh, to where we cut into the deficit as long as we uh, reduce spending? It 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 seems like the revenues are higher, aren't they? No, right the revenues now? are are somewhat higher. They'd be even higher uh, in the short term without the recent tax cut. But we're never going to grow ourselves out of this unless we do what you said, which is to find a way to restrain spending. And no one wants to do that. Uh, a lot of spending is more or less automatic. Uh, transfer payments, Social Security, things of that sort have a life of their own. There are very few discretionary options for cutting spending and no one wants to do that. So you're right, if we would, would restrain spending, we might be able to cut into the deficit more, but that's not very likely to happen. Sounds like Illinois. Right. I, except uh, that, not as dire as well, the one. Uh, uh, <laughs> fortunately, dire. Uh, Illinois doesn't have monetary powers. So right. uh, it, the federal government actually is worse than Illinois in a sense that Social Security is totally unfunded, but they also have the power to tax and the power to uh, manage the money supply. And they can inflate their way out of that too, in yeah. some senses, right, right. Fred? Right. right. So that's it, Brian. Anything else? Yep. Scary times. Uh, when in your life is, Brian, I assume you're older than 21, <laughs> but honestly, right. you may very well have lived through seven or eight of the most miserable decades on a human planet. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, Millions and millions of people in a hot war killed, followed by a global depression. We've had recessions. We, we, you know, we've had assassinations. We've had, uh, we've been on the brink of thermonuclear extinction in 1962. Uh, you know, I always ask my clients because they're all retired and they've lived six or seven decades at least. Some of them eight or nine. I mean, when we really think back, have we not really done nothing but lived through very scary times? I think uh, times are pretty good right now. I, I, I would go so far as to agree with Warren Buffett that today is the best day to ever be, be born in the uh, United States of America. I know that sounds silly, but compared to some of the risks and uh, the things that prior generations had to go to, um, boy, I think as a society, we've even, I'd go so far to say we've even gotten a little bit soft. Yeah, well, uh, there was a, a story about who's richer, uh, Bezos or... Uh, John D. Rockefeller, and there are all different kinds of ways of comparing. But the, the question was, if uh, John D. Rockefeller had an infection, where does he buy his antibiotics? Right, yeah. and, and so there, there are obviously big advantages that don't uh, show up necessarily in, uh, uh, in the uh, GDP numbers. Right. So, Brian, keep the faith. Optimism is the only worldview that squares with the facts. Thanks for calling, Brian. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Bye. Thanks. That was Brian. That was I know that we're just kind of going off course here, guys, but uh, I always like to remind people when they say that we're living in scary times and I like to back up. Yes, probably always will. Um, we run a retirement planning business. It's our job to say, yes, that's pro bad things are going to happen, but we can't drive our investment strategy based on that. And I'm not suggesting that Brian was, that was saying that, but in our world, the investment world, so many times people will make a statement like that or they genuinely feel that way. And it will cause them to invest in a way that really does lifetime harm and sends them into eternal sadness from an investment standpoint. Yeah, so. a lot of times it keeps people on the sidelines. It keeps them from investing at all. And, you know, it's, I always tell people, if you're waiting for a time where there's nothing scary going on in the world to invest, you're never going to be invested. There's always something. Right. I mean, I can't tell you guys the countless people I've, I've sat down with over the last five to eight or nine years that got spooked out of the stock market, you know, when the Dow was at seven or 8,000, they were still sitting on the sideline during this massive bull market based on fear. And it's understandable. Uh, but it, it, people sometimes wonder, and there's articles about, is it really worth paying an advisor 1% a year to manage all of your assets and your financial plan? You think, you know, in those big moments, that's really where a financial advisor earns all their money. It's those big moments when people want to, uh, you know, get rid of the diversified portfolio in the 90s and buy three stocks 
you know, that are, you know, started by 18 year old boys that have never been in a room with a woman that wasn't their mother. And that's how they were going to get rich. And you tell them not to do that. It's going to probably to end badly. And it'd probably be a really big mistake. Or it's the other side of that where, you know, uh, pervasive pessimism in, in 2008, 2009, that keeps people make, you know, uh, causes people, the emotional turmoil causes people to make a huge irreparable uh, irreversible mistake of getting out and staying out. Uh, it's right now, it's people wanting to put their money in Bitcoin at 18,000. It's those big moments in time that I always talk about it. When I talk to pr prospective clients, I always remind them that there's going to be pivotal moments over our relationship over the next two to three decades where things aren't going to be seemingly make sense. And you're going to want to do things either out of exuberation or, or exuberance or pessimism. And most of the time it's going to appear that your advisor is doing nothing. And most of the time that's the appropriate role, but it's in those big moments of time. It may be out of 365 days a year, 300 days a year may require nothing, but it's the 65 days we don't know about when they're coming or what the crisis is yours going to be. Um, you know, how much is, uh, is advice worth the saying, don't get out, don't, don't sell out when your money's half of what it was six months ago and stay out when it then would have tripled from that point. I mean, what's that really worth? And I think that's the essence of, of an, a good advisor relationship and, and kind of staying with that note. And again, you're listening to Paul Rudy's on the money radio on WDWS. You can call us at 356-9397 or text us on the castle heating and cooling text line at 351-5357. It's kind of a lead in Dave uh, to an article that you wrote uh, in most recent one in Investopedia, kind of the Bible of, of finance for a lot of people. And you wrote uh, the article is six questions to ask a financial advisor. So kind of what I was talking about, the value of an investment advisor, I think leads into this. Um, it, you know, it just kind of implies um, that, you know, you, you have to know what questions to ask, you know, or you're not even going to understand the answers uh, if it's not the right question. Uh, Paul has shared it, Brother Paul, on uh, our social media pages, so you can get the link. And if you're looking at Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, you'll get a link on that as well. But the first question you ask is, uh, or you wrote in the article, and Ryan, I'm going to point this to you, is, uh, are you a fiduciary? That word's used a lot. I'm not sure everybody gets it. Some people probably overuse it and assume that, if, you know, that that is the only thing that's important. But David's number one question is, are you a fiduciary? Uh, why is that important? Ultimately, uh, being a fiduciary or having that status generally represents the fact that you're going to be putting the client's best interest first. And so you have options out there. There are other advisors or people that manage money that don't follow the fiduciary standard. Uh, they follow what's called the suitability standard. And on its face, it seems like a good idea that I provide uh, investments or advice that's suitable for you, but it doesn't have to be in your best interest by law. So yeah, I came from a clothing background. My dad ran, managed Baskin Clothing for 30 plus years in Lincoln Square and in Marketplace for a while and on Green Street well, during those radical 70s when Fred was out there probably protesting. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, so that reminds me of this difference between suitability when people say, well, how would how, how, do it in a way? So I'm going to reflect on my haberdashery career and say, I'm like, the difference is suitability says, yeah, that suit fits you. Uh, the fiduciary rule says, yes, but it has to look good on you. So, I mean, there's, there's a difference between, you know, that is probably a silly way to think of it now that I just said that, but who cares? Well, I, so, I like it. so the key is it's really, it's where is your duty of uh, loyalty? Where, where is that placed? Is it at the firm you work for? Is it mm -hmm. for, or is it, placed at the client's level where you owe them your loyalty and your best interest. That's the essential difference. And it's not to say that somebody who operates under the suitability standard can't be putting the client first, but they have a, a bit of a conflict of interest where they could recommend a investment that is suitable, but there might be other investments out there that could have been better for the client, but they just opted not to provide them. Maybe simply because they earned a commission that, that provided them a higher amount of income which is a conflict of interest that is completely eradicated when you deal with the fiduciary standard. So a lot of times, Dave and guys, it comes down to how you're getting paid. So if you're, if you're advising somebody sells a, you know, buys a product, 
and you're going to get paid a commission for that product, you're probably under the registered representative side. Think of a brokerage firm, if you would, or an insurance agent who is licensed to sell some financial products, usually insurance oriented. Really, a lot of times it's how you're compensated. Mm -hmm. So do I, and you're going to talk about this conflict. It's, why do I tell them to buy the Vanguard total market index or now the Fidelity total market index has 0%, no tricks cost, or I tell them to buy the American funds, blue chip fund or whatever it is. And I get paid a five or so percent commission. It, it may be appropriate. It might, might be a good idea, but a lot of it comes down to how you're compensated. I think so. And that was actually the fourth thing on my list, but I think it does kind of flow nicely with the first one. And I've always taken a pretty soft stance on this because, you know, I used to work with a lot of advisors that weren't, I guess, entirely fee only. Um, and there's a lot of advisors who, who aren't necessarily held to a fiduciary duty that do provide uh, advice that probably is in the best interest of their clients. But I always figured like, why even open yourself up to that possibility or those conflicts of interest when you don't really have to. When yeah. there's and we'll circle back to that, but we have Natalie on line one. Oh, it's John. John on line one. John, welcome to Paul Rudy's On The Money. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm trying to come up with some resources to find out about uh, social security claiming strategies. Okay. Uh, you know, I look online and there's a blizzard of information out there and trying to find something that makes sense is uh, is uh, hard to do. Do you have any uh, insight into a good uh, location to find some good information? I'm trying to think so there's of commercial, good ones that are publicly uh, yeah. available. So it's different between what's publicly available for free or very low cost or all, you're essentially free and versus like the software that we have that's commercially oriented, uh, built into the financial planning modes. That's a great question. I haven't really thought about where would a, just a person who wants to look on their own get that. I, I, one thing you can do is certainly go to the University of Google, as I call it. Uh, and I suspect that there must be some reliable, Vanguard might be a really good site. I, Vanguard has a retirement kind of a university, if you will. It's a repository of kind of all things retirement. And I think it's a wonderful place to go. And you can go to vanguard.com and, and, and find your way there. That might be one place. You know, another helpful resource for social security is, I think it's called the Social Security Owner's Manual. Oh, is that the book? Yes. So um, uh, Jim Blankenship, uh, and I and I bought, I bought the book. And, and Jim's over in the Springfield area. It's called the, uh, um, yeah, I think you're right. It's, I think it is. It's like Social Security Owner's Manual. Yeah, it's by Jim Blankenship. And I can, and I can promote that book. I have no relationship with uh, Jim. Uh, he's a terrific writer, and he wrote a terrific book. And I would start there. If you have trouble finding that book, or you want to drop by and just borrow ours, just call 356-1400. It may be highlighted, John. <laughs> so Enough. that may be good or bad, but it's probably highlighted. But you're certainly welcome to... Uh, take our copy out for a few days. It's a, it's a one or two day read. And one place I would check for sure is there's a blog. It's called Nerds Eye View. Uh, the author's Michael Kitsis, uh, K-I-T-C-E-S. And he has a lot of great content. I'd be amazed if he doesn't have quite a few articles on social security claiming. There. I, I think you could go right there to, uh, to Michael Kitsis' uh, website, Nerds Eye View, and, and find a dozen articles that we've probably read and we respect the guy. He's kind of a thought leader in the industry. Uh, he writes extremely well. It's understandable. And I think that would put you way ahead of most people on your search for knowledge on that issue. All right. And it does sound like each individual situation is so different that there aren't any great rules of thumb to follow. Uh, sort of. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say technically you're absolutely right. Um, I could tell you after 35 years of doing this in the classic sense of a, a dual income couple where one has higher earnings than the other, uh, that it's not unusual. It's probably more likely than not that we're going to have the higher earner. Of course, again, this is a broad brush job. Higher earner, well, wait till 70 if they can and the lower earner probably you know take it earlier yeah probably in your sure. full retirement account for sure full I, retirement age i i think for most people um in most situations having you know in a seat for single people too delaying kind of makes sense 
if you can afford it. So that's kind of the caveat there is a lot of people don't have the option to delay till 70 because you have to be able to bridge sure. the gap. Yeah. You know, unless you're waiting till that actual date to retire, you're going to have to have basically a, a, a store of money or investment assets right. to fund your lifestyle between now and the time you claim social security. And David, you probably bring up, <clears throat> and John, I think this is really important. So you could do all that research you want, but ultimately the best way to find out the optimal strategy is in the backdrop of your retirement plan. Because what might look optimal in isolation for you, when you add it to all of your other income streams and your your attitude towards how print, using principal and principal reduction for the first three or four or five or six years. So you could start there, but at the end of the day, you're not really going to know until somebody does a really good retirement plan for you with that integrated as a piece of it. And the reason I say that is when you take social security it might also impact whether you do Roth conversions in the first three to five years. So there's a lot of reasons why what looks like optimal strategy in isolation may not be your best strategy. I know that doesn't answer your question. And by the way, uh, the book is the social securities. Uh, well, Paul just sent it to me. Uh, I'm just going to get it for you. Bear with me. The Social Security Owner's Manual by Jim Blankenship. So that's the name of that book. Paul did put a link to it on our uh, Facebook live feed and maybe elsewhere. But uh, I'd start there. But the real answer, and it's a mushy answer, is the best thing to do is have somebody run a variety of strategies in the backdrop of your overall retirement plan. Great information as usual. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Once again, it's kind of like, hey, we're retirement planners and we're telling people they need a retirement plan, which is like, like I always say, it's like a barber telling you you need a haircut. It really is a lot of questions, though, just in I think almost any industry. It's kind of like, well, it depends on so many factors. And when people call in with an acute issue, a lot of times it does. You know, it's impossible to give a, a, a clear cut answer without knowing a lot of other stuff. And what do you find your peers just anecdotally doing if they even talk about it? Well, to be honest, I don't think they talk a lot about it because uh, most people I uh, know are uh, in SERS and they have uh, diminished Social Security, so it's not as big an issue there as it would be for other people. I had another question, though, going back. Go ahead. Uh, uh, we know you'd like to have a fiduciary, but how, how do you know someone actually is a fiduciary? But is saying it the same thing as being one, or how do you prove it if you're a financial? Well, you ask them what capacity uh, they are in. Are they a registered representative or are you a registered investment advisor? And two, will you sign this letter stating that in fact you will operate in a fiduciary manner to me? And it's a letter we would be happy to sign. So, or, or, right. so one thing you could do now, they could still lie to you. But there's no, they, there's no, uh, there's no badge. But there's no uh, list we can go to online to see who's a fiduciary and who's not. A best thing for practical purposes, yeah. Brad, is are you a registered representative? Are you an insur insurance agent? Or are you a registered investment advisory firm with the state of Illinois or in Illinois' case, if you're an Illinois resident, or with the SEC if you're large enough? We're with the S Securities and Exchange Commission. And if they're now, so that's really the, the, the best way to do it. But have them put it in writing if you feel more comfortable. Uh, wouldn't be a bad idea. Now, it doesn't tell you whether they're a knucklehead or not. Obviously, that's a whole other issue. Maybe we'll get to another day. But I think, Dave, as you said, you, you tend to take a soft view. There are people that are registered investment advisors that um, kind of have this belief or hold out publicly that unless you're a fiduciary, you're kind of a crook and you, there's no way that you can do a good job. I know some terrific people in this town that are registered representatives that don't uh, technically uh, mandated to act in a fiduciary capacity that is put their client's best interest, but they sure darn well do. So uh, it's just one of the things, are you a fiduciary is certainly one thing that you could put in a filter that says, well, uh, I like John or Bill or Mary, uh, but you know what? I would feel more comfortable if I knew that I wasn't, they weren't earning a commission and that couldn't in any way conflict their advice. There's always conflicts, but we can, that's one conflict that investors can eliminate. Uh, if they feel better about that. Uh, the second one, and David, I'm going to give this to you, is what is your investment philosophy? So the first one is, are you a fiduciary? The second one, are these in importance uh, as far as uh, the order of importance? What is your philosophy? Honestly, not necessarily. Okay. I just kind of thought of, you know, what are things that are helpful questions to ask? Because I, you know, we've talked about this on a previous show. I think it's tough to 
uh, to choose a financial advisor when you're, I mean, you're not a financial expert. So I think providing people a little bit of guidance was just the, the goal of this okay. article. Yep. Um, but when I think of investment philosophy, I, and I, in the article I mentioned, I don't think there's necessarily one that you have to go with. There's no right or wrong necessarily here. There's kind of two camps. There's one that basically says, I'm going to try to outperform the market by picking stocks or picking mutual funds that pick stocks or jumping in and out of the market or when to overweight certain assets and underweight others, vice versa. Um, that's called active management typically. And then the other is, hey, we're just going to capture market returns using low cost index funds. We're going to broadly diversify and the returns are going to be what they're going to be. Um, I did say, you know, I think ultimately you want to understand the investment approach the advisor is going to take because they can lead to very different types of results. Um, if you take an active management approach, there's just a lot more um, uncertainty around how they will perform relative to how the market performs. And if that is not appealing to your personality, then that, that's something to consider. Um, but I did mention, you know, you need to be aware that the evidence is fairly compelling that the vast majority of actively managed mutual funds who are taking that type of investment approach underperform their benchmark. It's something like over 85% underperform their benchmark over. So it's really, uh, you wouldn't say you're, you're not wise for uh, choosing an active strategy, just saying, just understand the realities are, if history's any guide, you're probably going to be baking disappointment into your results. Right. You, you may be the one that defies that, uh, defies the odds, but it's one of those risks that you can eliminate. Right. Underperformance you can eliminate. Well, and at least know what you're getting into so you know what to expect. And number three, how will I know if I'm on track to achieve my goal? So like, what are we going to sit around and talk about when we have our meeting? I mean, how, how do I know? How do I measure whether uh, I'm okay or not at any given point of time, Ryan? And that's, I guess, uh, us being financial advisors, going back to our, our favorite song and dance, having a financial plan that manages what financial goals you have for your life, for your retirement, and just that it's in concert with your investment strategy. Uh, the, the plan obviously should take into account uh, your goals and how those goals need to be uh, funded. And if they're going to need to have a higher or lower uh, asset allocation to stocks versus bonds, the goal should really decide that based on your needs rather than your just general feelings towards the market. Because in the end, you need to fund a lifestyle and the, and the investments will be able to do that for you. I tell clients, look, we're not going to sit around and talk about performance all the time because we, you know, performance is going to be what it's going to be. As Dave says, what we do is we harness and harvest those returns. Uh, we really have to just relate through a plan. That's the only thing we're ever going to relate through is going to be that financial plan. And that financial plan is what you're saying is what tells us whether we're moving the ball forward or backwards or we're standing still. Mm -hmm. So I think it's getting always, we always circle back to it's the planning that's really the important role. Asset management is very important, but the asset management side is a slave to the plan and you can't unbundle them. You can't say, well, I want one, but not the other. One is only valuable in, you know, in when it's attached to the other, well, in my and, view. And frankly, the reason I included that one in there is because there are still a lot of financial advisors that really all they do is manage an investment portfolio. They don't really have a financial plan guiding things. And if that's the case, you really don't know if you're on track to right. meet whatever financial goals you have. That's just like, you might as well just have a fortune cookie uh, with that because, you know, it's, it's just so random. We're going, I'm going to circle back to number four, how are you compensated? But I'm going to add a little twist to it. There's nothing wrong to looking your advisor square in the eye and saying, okay, not only how are you compensated, tell me if I do this exactly how much it costs me to do this. And by the way, if they always, if they say nothing and they're on the, you know, an insurance agent or a registered rep, that's when the alarm should go up. It always costs something. Uh, but don't, clients are a little bit intimidated or people are intimidated, I think, to ask blunt questions, blunt force questions. And I think I've probably told every prospect that's walked through my door, prospective client, look, I'm going to be really blunt. I ask you to be really blunt. There is not a question, Mr. and Mrs. Potential Client, that you can ask me that's going to offend me. And so let's get them out on the table because what any advisor sells is invisible, right? What we sell is invisible. We can't prove anything. I can't prove that you're going to be ha have a retirement that you, you accomplish everything you want uh, between now and when you wake up in heaven. Uh, 
so you really, a lot of it comes down to a feeling of trust and completeness and transparency. And that begins at the very beginning meeting and clients, if you're not blunt, and here's another thing I tell clients, and you might want to keep this in mind for, for listeners. Clients, especially in the Midwest, we're a kind group of people. We don't like to ask tough questions. We don't like to have anybody's feelings hurt. And I always tell people, and I'll look them, David you, and Ryan, you can, how many times have you heard me look, you know, say this, looking into a client, potential client's eyes, look, your job is not to make my family money or my family happy. It is to make take care of your family and make your family money and make your family happy. So let's both understand that. And that's where my bluntness, I think, comes in and may be helpful. So be blunt. Uh, number five, do you hold any designations? David? Yeah. And you no, know, I don't. This is another one. It hurts. There's a lot of things. I think choosing an advisor, a lot of it does come down to personality and someone that you trust. But it's just another like you said, another factor to consider, another filter to kind of narrow the list down of advisors that you're considering. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of different credentials out there. I think the three big ones that people might want to be aware of, honestly, are the certified financial planner designation. So that's kind of a broader financial planning uh, specific um, credential. There's chartered financial analyst, which is the CFA. That's much more investment focused. It's a super deep dive into investments. A lot of times you'll see that more commonly in firms that take an active management type of investment approach. And then the third big one, and, and this, I don't know, you see some financial advisor with it, but CPA, which is, is a certified public accountant, um, that's really, as pe I think most people probably know, more of a tax related credential. And kind of what I said here is like, what you wanna do is match up the expertise of your advisor with your particular needs. So if you have more of like tax questions and more of a tax heavy issue, um, then you probably want someone who's got a CPA. If you're um, more financial planning oriented, you probably want a CFP. And if you really are more focused on the investments and you like the active management approach and you want someone who's gonna try to beat the market, well, then you, maybe you're leaning towards someone with like a CFA. And then there's other ones that are just specific to certain situations. There's ones for people who specifically work with medical doctors. There's one for people who work with uh, divorcees. And, and you went on and so did uh, David to get the RICP, which is the Retirement Income Certified Professional? Or yeah. Planner. Okay, yep. I was getting them wrong backwards. And that's even a, a special niche since we're in the retirement business. You guys wanted to get, uh, oh, Ryan, we told you you're gonna get that too. Uh, <laughs> he keeps having those kids and, you know, he tries to say he's too busy. Uh, but that was really, uh, you did that specifically because look, we're in the business of really managing income streams and determining what the optimal income streams are going to be in retirement. Uh, so it was even some of those. So, uh, that's, I think those are six positive things, uh, to think about uh, when you're engaging. As I said, you know, I've said many times, a lot of it's, comes down to likability and then that doesn't always get you where you, the ending result. Uh, Fred, you probably have different questions that you ask at like on pension boards, I suspect. Yeah. But I guess we expect uh, the, our money managers aren't necessarily going to uh, fiduciaries when they start out because almost every uh, potential money manager over promises what they can uh, provide. But isn't that, uh, would it be fair to say on the active management side, those right. that pr those that claim that they can do better than the market. Uh, but, they, they, but, it's easy to sell, but hard to deliver. As but well. everyone, everyone claims that. And there's the story uh, you're talking about mutual funds or uh, private equity. You have to be in the top uh, quartile or top 15% to make it go. But everyone believes they're smart enough to choose the top quartile. Oh, sure. Uh, right. first, and, you're, and no one is that smart. And it's consistent, like all across pension boards or, or endowments. It's kind of the... It's kind of a group think, isn't it? But is that changing? Well, it's Have changing you seen toward, changes over it, the years? It's a gradual movement towards uh, passive, but there's yeah. also all kinds of other pressures sure. for the public pension board. That, Not uh, politics pushes. involved, are there? <laughs> so anyway, we're going to go to Jim. Jim, thanks for calling. Paul Rudy's on the money. How can we help you? Yes, Paul. Well, more of a specific question. I know you're talking about investment in general. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Looking for your opinion on a couple segments of the market particularly uh, BDCs, business development companies, if I uh, understand the risk and the volatility, but the yields are 
quite good and maybe to a lesser extent MLP, uh, Master Limited Partnership. Okay. Um, so these, the attractiveness tends to be, and I've never recommended any of them, by the way, and I've always recommended people stay away from them, but, uh, but they are, but what attracts people to them, as you said, Jim, is they tend to pay out uh, or promise to pay out really attractive yields compared to what you can get in alternative, safer type of investments. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use a broad brush here. Um, I can tell you in my experience that everybody I told to stay away from them was glad I did, ultimately. Uh, and uh, just a, a, a general observation that I think probably holds more true than anything I've ever learned in 35 years in this business, the quest for a higher yield, I've seen more money lost by people looking for higher yields than any other strategy on the planet Earth. So uh, you know, I, I get why people are attracted to them, Jim. Uh, you know, uh, that's what makes human nature a failed investor. <clears throat> but my view on them is, would be classified as negative. And, and, not, and this is not a specific one. Some of them are going to work out. Some aren't. It's just, it's an area where it, it just has zero interest to me. I've never recommended them. And I certainly wouldn't recommend them today. I, I, it probably doesn't help you. MLPs. Uh, same thing. Uh, again, they're engineered. They tend to be, they, they tend to be uh, oriented to the energy sector. Uh, some I'm sure will do fantastic. Uh, but from my experience, I say stay away from them. 10 years from now, you'll send me a, a, a box of chocolates. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone was jumping on the MLP bandwagon about what, a decade ago, maybe even a little less than that. Five, in the last five to 10 years, it's certainly, uh, and, and again, uh, and where, where, do you, where did you see the popularity of private REITs, uh, ML, Master Limited Partnerships, or MLPs, and then the, the others, the, 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 what'd you, the first one was the BDC? Yeah, BDC, yeah, Business the, Development Company. Yeah, like, okay. Uh, so a variety of uh, right. Aries Capital would be a... Okay, so you, when do you see these things pop up? And the same thing as when junk bonds in the late 70s, early, I mean, uh, late 80s, uh, junk bonds, because yields had dropped in CDs, et cetera, somewhat. Um, there's always, Wall Street loves uh, to pack its garbage for people and they know exactly what to do. They know how to pander to investors. Nobody knows it like Wall Street does. They're like, oh, interest rates, people are earning zero on their CDs. Let's go package a bunch of this garbage, show them a six or seven or eight or a 10% yield. They can't help, the right side of their brain is going to make them instantly strike out and buy some uh, for that yield. I have a very unfavorable uh, feelings about Wall Street and some of the shenanigans that they package for investors. Even more so, there's uh, the administrative uh, burden. Uh, I uh, got into a real estate limited partnership back in the early 80s. And I don't you and I, everybody else. I don't think I lost money, but it took me 15 years to get it off my tax return. I still have <laughs> clients that, you know, prior to me that bought them, you know, prior to 84, they kind of sizzled, fizzled out at 84, 85, yeah. 86 with the Tefra. Sure, and, uh, and there's some of them still, even though they're profitable, it's kind of like, yeah. it's taken forever. It's like we the get, Roach Motel of investments. You get $7 of income yeah. and $4 of expenses. You and you got out three forms. You fill out forms. You have to give it to your CPA. Jim, that's our long way of bantering and saying, okay. just do yourself a favor and stay away. Don't bite. Pro I promise you, you'll, you'll, you'll be glad. Appreciate your comments. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for calling. Uh, we got a few minutes left, guys. Uh, uh, so that's pretty much covering it today. Uh, anything you guys want to add to those six questions or thoughts and anything we talked about today? I don't think so. I think on one more thing on, on our just most recent discussion is I think the first thing you said might be the most helpful for people who are listening is, you know, there's no reason that you need to stretch for yield. You can just sell pieces of your portfolio to generate income in retirement. But Dave, and, that runs counter to what a 60 and 70 year old thinks. Wait a minute, spend my principal? And the answer is, yes, you should be thinking about spending some of your principal between now and when you wake up in heaven, but it's a foreign concept to people. And like you said, when people stretch for yield, you end up going into, especially in today's day and age, really high risk investments, and they don't realize what they're getting into. So it yeah. feels safe because you're getting the yield, but you're really building a much riskier portfolio. Right. I was going to repeat something that you probably told me 10 or 15 years ago, which is actually probably zero on the list of one to six, and that is uh, make sure that you... Uh, 
your advisor actually puts your money in where it's supposed to go and you don't write your check to the advisor. Oh, that's a good, that's a, that's okay. I'm going to add one to your list. Dave. Yeah. seven. Fred just brought it up. Zero. Are you taking custody of my funds or is there a third party where my money is held separately and segregated with my name and tax ID number on it? If, if, if they say we take custody and you write it out to Rudy wealth management, which we don't allow people to do, but if they did, that means we're, we, that means an advisor is, is ming, co-mingling their money with yours and bad things can happen. That's how bad things happen. That's how Bernie Madoff was able to do what he did. Uh, I tell people this all the time. When that first popped up, people would say, well, how did you think that happened? I said, I know how it happened. He had custody because that's the only way you can really steal people's money. So that's a really important question, Fred, actually, of, of the seven. Uh, I'm glad you did it on, you know, yeah. you know, let Dave show, you know, he doesn't know everything. Uh, do you take custody of my money or is it safely held with a third party custodian of some sort? And, you know, and, and if the answer is they take custody of it, uh, do yourself a favor, uh, scratch it off the list right away. I would say in this town, I'm not aware of anybody that really takes custody, but there might be, uh, but most of the advisors I can think of don't. So I think, it's, it's worthy of the question for sure, but chances are the answer is going to be no. And that's the answer you want. Well, guys, thanks. And thanks for everybody listening to Paul Rudy's On The Money and watching on FaceTime Live. And Dr. Fred Gertz, the great one. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Join us for the second and fourth Tuesday of...